All right, good evening, my purification warriors. Tonight is the finale. You've made it 21 days or you should be finishing tomorrow. So we will get started tonight. So just remember, this has been a, a kind of a transformational period for most of you. Some of you, this is a repeat doing it again. Um, I try to give you new information each time. Um, today, I want to talk about keto and a little bit about the omega threes and sixes that we talked about last week. So I'll kind of overlap some things, but I want to give you some really good things to start with for the for this next um, your new phase, your new normal. So I, I found this quote a long time ago, and it really kind of re reached out to me because I think that we don't really know that we can be as great as we can be, and we have the opportunity to do that by just taking care of ourselves. And that's why I, I like to take the time to do these educational programs. So your first step, congratulations, you've made it or you're almost making it. So you know, now's the time to kind of continue this. So we'll kind of go through some things at the end to talk about how to get you into the new phase after we finish this, when you, when you don't have me every week, but you could. We do have a cottage, so when you when you feel like you're falling off the wagon, I just move you in, and you have to get up with me at four in the morning and do all that kind of good stuff. All right, so purification, it gives you a fresh new start. I always like to do it at the beginning of the year. You know that I personally do it twice a year. We will do uh, other programs throughout the um, year like we did last year. We will do them on Zoom, and I just scheduled the whole year for Zoom. Um, the advantage of that is I can reach out to more people. Um, the disadvantage is I don't get to cook for you, and I'm so sorry. Um, but the program is really important. You know, it reduces your toxic exposure, increases your elimination, increases your nutritional reserves, and also increases the foods you're eating, teaching you about that nutritional de density, the fiber rich, nu nutrition rich and fiber dense foods. And digestion is really the key to your health. When I see a patient for functional medicine, the top four things I see, number one, digestion, number two, blood sugar or weight management issues, number three, adrenal or thyroid, and number four, liver. So all those things happen, but if we don't take care of digestion first, we don't get anything fixed because if I can't get you to even absorb the foods you're eating or any kind of supplementation, then all is for naught. So most of our chronic illnesses are really due to poor eating habits and poor food choices. And then all the pharmaceuticals and over-the-counter relief meds we have. So <clears throat> I always use this slide because I think it's really important that we need to talk about eating, eating under stress. Remember, eating should be pleasurable. It's a parasympathetic function. Parasympathetic is the calm part of your system and proper chewing of your food. It's not broken down enough. Your hydrochloric acid and your enzymes can't help you properly digest. So chewing... You don't have to chew 32 times, but, you know, chew the food till it's, it's, you know, broken down enough so you can swallow it. I just drives me crazy to be at a restaurant and watch people put a mouthful of food in, not even chew it, and then wash it down with a cold soda or something like that. Please chew the food. That's how you break down the, all the nutrients in it and all the fiber in it for your body to digest. And then drinking while you eat. So <clears throat> normally, unless it's a glass of wine, when we're not on the purification, um, we don't really drink during dinner. Uh, you can drink after or you can drink before, but during dinner, that kind of uh, skews your digestive enzymes. So we want to make sure that your, your digestive enzymes, and your hydrochloric acid are working you know, keenly to, to break down those foods. Remember, we talked about hydration for your body, half your body weight in ounces. This is a good rule of thumb. So when we don't, when we do eat, and we don't digest the foods, it creates an inflammatory process and that inflammation and um, in the immune system are compromised. So this is kind of a, a picture here. I don't know if you can see my arrow. Let me see if what I can do here. Hold on, let me move this out of my way. Sorry about this. I don't have anything to, no, I don't have a way to do that right now. So so this is a, a representing your your intestines. So when your your stomach is, when you put food in it, your stomach has to be really, really, really acidic, 1.5 to 2.0 and a pH. That food breaks the food down. When it goes in the small intestine, the small intestine is alkaline, which means that it, it, it's not designed to break food down. It's designed to take those tiny food particles and absorb them. We can see these leaky and inflamed junctions. When those food particles come in and they're too big, 
they actually break these junctions up. And then these particles get into the bloodstream and the body then thinks, oh my gosh, we have an inflammatory process. And that inflammatory process comes out in our skin, damages our immune system. Um, we have, uh, the skin is the, probably the biggest thing that I see. And then we, that causes a whole host of other things that, that really inflame our inflammatory system. But it also breaches the blood brain barrier and, and causes nutrient deficiency and malabsorption. So we wanna make sure we're always breaking that food down. <clears throat> and the, and we, you, you hear me say this all the time that your large intestine is your primary immune organ. It contains 70% of your gut assisted lymph tissue. And that, those are your immune cells. And it also, remember, it has 95% of your serotonin, which is for your brain. So uh, that large intestine has to be really key. So if we eat something in our stomach and it's not broken down properly and because there's not enough acid, because people are taking omeprazole, the purple pill, and all those things, which should only be taken for short term, which tells your body to stop producing hydrochloric acid, which we need as we, especially as we age, because it declines, and we need those enzymes to break the food down. So it goes in the small intestine. Small intestine then says, hey, I don't, I don't think I can break this down. And if it really says I can't break it down, it gets rid of it. So you throw up. If it makes a decision to go ahead and let it go through, then it gets to the large intestine. Large intestine's like, hey, what are you doing to me? I, I can't do it, deal with all this big stuff. So then that creates a, a kind of a diarrhea situation or loose bowels because it's like, we got to get this out of here. It's too big for me to use too. So we really want that to work well. So we want to really build our good bacteria. And we remember that good bacteria is uh, what breaks everything down and you have to use something to, so we, that's why we use prosymbiotic. You hear me say that all the time in the office. You want a prebiotic to feed the good bacteria, to build your colony, to build your gut flora. If you're not, and if you're just eating probiotics, you're putting the good guys in, you're not feeding them, they die. So you never really build your flora. The whole idea with prosymbiotic is to build that gut flora and then maintain it. So for me, I do the prosymbiotic once or twice a week. I just open the capsules right on my tongue and that just kind of keeps the maintenance of that. So that's pretty important to kind of work on because especially in this time of COVID, we want all of our immune systems to be really uh, strong. And this is one way we can do it without taking prescription medication. So I'll talk a little bit about the brain span because I think that's important. We talked about oils last week and, and I just want you to know that, you know, really to extend your quality of life, you have to have good cell health and you have to have good brain health. And if you, you're not having both of those, then it, we're not getting that optimal aging that we want or the healthy aging. And when I call, talk about healthy aging, I'm talking about we live to be 80, 90, 100 years old, and then you die. We don't want to get into our 60s and then have 20 or 30 years of chronic disease where you're not living a, a wonderful life. So this is why I always I really talk to you and, and push you to be better about taking care of you. We only get one body. We can't trade it in on a new model. So remember your brain health, that's your engine of wellness. Your brain runs everything. So if it's not working, functioning properly, then the rest of your body is not going to. So that's why I like the brain span. I'm just going to talk a little short bit about it for those that haven't heard about it. So we have expected normal quality of life, and then we decline with aging. It doesn't have to be that way. My goal is to prove that. So when I'm 90 years old and I'm still talking on here and telling you these things, I'll be proof in the pudding. So we talked last week about seed oils and we talked about omega-3 versus omega-6. So omega-3s are the good eicosanoids and omega-6s are the bad eicosanoids. And the omega-3s, as you can see on the left-hand side, prevent blood clots, you know, cause dil good dilation of the blood vessels means it opens them, opens them up, helps to reduce pain, reduce inflammation, decreases cell division, enhances the immune system, and improves brain function. The omega-6, on the other hand, promotes blood clotting, constricts blood vessels, increases uh, inflammation and pain, increases cell division, depresses the immune system, and depresses brain function. So you can see why we want to lean more to the omega-3s. So when we talk about that, and when we talk about omega-6s, those fats are really, really associated with infl inflammation. So just looking at these foods like corn chips, you can see they have, we look at a ratio and it should be a, a one omega-3 to four omega-6s. Then the normal diet in America now is a one to 25. So I mean, that's, and here's what causes it right here. So if you look at the corn chips, you can see that you have one omega-3 per every 28 milligrams of omega-6s. So there's that one to 28 ratio right there. Look at the fast, the Subway tuna sub, one mega, omega-3 to seven. So that's not as bad. But 
we use the brain span. So it's a finger prick. And then we send you a, um, a nerve, I'm sorry, a, a mental cognitive test. And you do that on your tablet, not on your phone. Um, we can, we can, I'll send you the information on that, but that's one way we can test where you are. If you have anybody in your family that you're taking care of, uh, like a, a parent or aunt or uncle, grandmother, grandfather that are suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, those are neurological d diseases. And we, we now we call um, al Alzheimer's a type three diabetes. So this is one way we can test and see where you are to see what we can do to improve your, your aging process. So you've got a trillion cells, a cell membrane, and the, the cell membrane determines the health and the function of, of that cell. The fatty acids then determine the health and function of the cell membrane. So the brain, the brain uh, blood spot test is what we use to test that, to see how many omega-3s you have in your system. And this is just a study that was done that just shows you that the, ri the risk of sudden death declines. So the higher levels of omega-3s in the blood reduces almost 90% the, the sudden death of um, heart disease or ca cardiac disease. So that was just a short blip on that, but I really wanna talk about ketones. Our, our little guy here from Geico, I just saved a bunch of money on coffee, energy drinks and ibuprofen by switching to ketones. So let's talk about ketones, because I really would like for you to think about kind of transitioning, not going into ketosis. I will make it so super easy for you. But when you can see the advantages of how your body operates, I've been doing this for almost three years now, and I love it because I don't get hungry. I have plenty of energy. Uh, you know, my, my body responds really well in recovery, um, losing body fat and maintaining muscle. So we have three types of ketones. We have an uh, acetoacetate, we have a, a beta hydroxy a hydroxybutyrate acid and an acetone. So those are all some of the types of ketone bodies that our body uh, actually goes does when it goes into ketosis. I'm not going to make you go into ketosis. We're just going to eat a low keto uh, keto diet or a low carb diet. So how does it work? So the traditional high carb diet, you see the glucose level rises, the pancreas then secretes insulin, the insulin is then uh, shuttles into the glucose into the cell, and that gives us energy. But on a keto diet, we're going to, when the glucose levels fall, the lipase in our, in our livers is, releases uh, stored triglycerides. Those triglycerides, the um, triglycerides or the fatty acids are just cleaved off there. And then the fatty acids travel to the liver to produce the energy. The liver then produces ketones for energy. It's a better burning fuel, a longer burning fuel, and you don't run out. So this is really important. And when we talk about a ketogenic diet, Originally, they used it for kids that um, had epilepsy. So now we found that it has a lot of benefits for you know reduction of diabetes, heart disease, epilepsy, neurological diseases, cancer, respiratory diseases, acne, uh, PCOS, and weight loss. And it's interesting. I just had a, a patient comment about that he hadn't been in for a while, but he he's lost 90 pounds by doing his um, doing a keto diet. So it can be done. All right, and that's, that was eight months worth, so that he lost 90 pounds. So here's a couple um, articles here. This one talks about eating fat causes heart disease. So this is from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This was 2010. So this is information has been around a long time. So right in the conclusion, I just kind of skip to the bottom here. Um, the perspective studies here, there's no significant evidence for concluding that dietary saturated fat is associated with increased risk of cardi uh, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, or cardiovascular disease. So there you have it right there. This is clinical nutrition. Here's another article. This is by NCBI. Uh, we use this a lot when I'm teaching doctors to do that. It's also brain protective. A ketogenic diet provides symptomatic and disease modifying activity in a broad range of neurogenerative disorders, including Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and may be also protective in traumatic brain injury and stroke. So, I mean, for me, when I see these things, that just shows a lot of power, not just that you're going to lose weight and feel good, but it's actually protecting your brain. And if you want to get rid of excess stubborn fat, the problem is that's, that fat is actually stuck, that energy is stuck in the cell, in the fat cells. And so, like I said, when my, my goal, well, the, the best way I can describe it is when you get hungry and you don't eat, your body starts burning fat. It starts cleaving off the triglycerides, those fatty acids, and then the fatty acids become your fuel. And it releases this energy that's stuck in the fat cells. And that's what we want. 
So we have two fuel sources. We have sugar. 99% of the people are only burning sugar, and the other is fat or ketones. And the way that I describe this as fuel, when you eat sugar or a heavy carbohydrate diet, which a lot the I mean, look at our look at our our United States. You know, 68% of our population population is either overweight or obese, and that means they're eating a lot of sugar. So if you eat too much sugar, and then you burn it for fuel and you run out, your body can't go from burning sugar to burning fat. It has to utilize something. Well, the next readily available thing is muscle. So you start muscle wasting. So patients will come in, they'll get on the, the truth slayer, my in-body machine, and they'll see, oh, well, they think they're not overweight. Their weight may be in, in reason, but we have a condition where we call them tofi thin on the outside, fat on the inside, because they're eating so much sugar, they're burning up muscle and just building fat. Because when you burn up muscle, what do you replace it with? Fat. So when you switch over to doing a keto st style of diet, you're using fat as your fuel. It's like an oil lamp and a, sh and a alcohol lamp. Alcohol lamp being the sugar lamp and the oil lamp being fat. The fat lamp is going to burn a lot longer because it's a slow burning fuel. The alcohol lamp will burn up pretty quickly because it's a very um, unstable fuel. And God knows a lot of us have enough of the fat to use as fuel. So, but I, I will tell you that just as an athlete, it's just been amazing for me, especially as an aging athlete. I think that's really important. So your blood sugar must be 100. So the body is programmed to do whatever it can, can do to maintain sugars at 100. So it works hard to fight it when it goes down, and it works hard to make it level when it goes up. At 100, the person is their best mentally and physically. 100 means you have exactly two teaspoons of sugar in your blood. That doesn't mean fasting blood sugar. That means after you eat. So your blood sugar will go up, but it will come back down. Insulin is the hormone that actually regulates and lowers that blood sugar by removing the sugar. And then insulin converts sugar to fat, and it's just a one-way street. So if you eat sugar, it gets converted to fat, and then the sugar is what we use for our fuel. But it's stored as fat, and we can't really get it out of there because the body's, you know, we talked about last week how, or I didn't talk to you last week, but we've talked about how the carbohydrate is a big bulky on the chain of um, carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. And when you eat them, if you're not going to utilize them right away, like you have a big carb dinner at night and you go to sleep, your body's like, well, I, I can't use this. I'm going to break it down in nice, neat packages we'll call fat, and we know where they store get stored. So this is why I want to really work on getting you a little less sugar happy and a little more fat happy. I promise you, you will be more happy. You'll you'll have uh, you'll be better as far as uh, satiated because that's the whole idea with fat. So when we talk about diabetes, type two diabetes, remember type two by diabetes is caused by us, and what happens is the pancreas is sending out insulin, but the sugar the the um, cells are so full of sugar and glucose that they can't receive them anymore. So they just turn it away. And then that, that insulin is just kind of in the bloodstream and we can't manage it. A type one diabetic, the pancreas doesn't even make insulin. So it, it's a whole different ball game. So when we talk about glucose, as we increase glucose, our hunger cravings and moodiness increase. If we decrease glucose, we start burning fat and it won't release in, a, in the presence of insulin. So we have highs and lows. We have uh, insulin resistance or the high levels and we have a, the low levels, which is insulin sen sensitive. So when we look at the, the hypoglycemia and the hyperglycemia, we won't really have that problem when we're doing a keto style diet. Now, if you're a uh, type one diabetic, you'll have to talk to me. I'll have to give you some special things to do. If you're type two diabetic, it won't matter. You're not gonna go into ketosis. We're gonna do a keto style of diet. So don't let that scare you. To go into ketosis, it's a 20 grams of carbohydrates a day. That's very hard to do. And most patients aren't successful at it. So sugar is glucose and it's stored. The liver holds seven tablespoons of sugar. Your muscles hold about 21 tablespoons of sugar. So it doesn't need any more. And we, we eat far too much to, to override that. So the liver, if you eat no sugar, you become dependent on liver sugar, which will last 72 hours. The brain and the body will starve and die unless, unless you tap into your fat reserves. And if I need to tell you where those fat reserves are, if you're a female, you can put your hands down just on either side of your hip or on your belly and back of your arms. And men usually carry it a little bit more in their belly and the back of their uh, shoulders. So we all have some reserves we can tap into. 
Remember, fat is a very misunderstood thing. It's not a cushion and it's not an insulator. And in Florida, except for maybe today or tomorrow, we don't really need that. So what's the purpose of fat? Well, you know, we need it for our organs. It's a survival gland and it protects, protects us against starvation. So if you go on a drastically low calorie diet, your body then says, oh, well, if we're not getting enough food, so we're going to hold on to the fat and protect us in case in this, in this time of famine. So I will say that if we protect ourselves in a time of famine, there's no famine these days. You can just go to the grocery store. So sugar is the fat is the backup organ for sugar. So it's the big prime, the primary purpose of the fat is that it it's there when you need it. So the whole idea of being keto style is that you eat enough fat so your body can utilize the fat and not eat a, a lot of sugar. So we want to starve the body of sugar and we and reduce calories versus reducing calories and exercising more. Because we already know the calories in and calories out doesn't work for everybody. But it definitely, when we starve the body of sugar, we can utilize fat as a fuel instead. So mainstream recommendations recommend lowered calories, but with a 65% of your total calories being from carbohydrate. That's what they've said for years. Now we know it's wrong because our, our lipid levels have, ra have been raised and it's just not the healthiest thing that we, we want to see in our diet. Plus it also increases inflammation. So when you're calculating what your carbs are, you must keep your net carbs to, I, 50, to 50 grams. I'm going to tell you, let's go uh, less than 100. Let's start with less than 100. I would say staying between 50 and 100 would be very easy. My day is about 50 to 75, and I kind of vary it. Remember, I do the, the Basudan confusion principle. I never do the same thing in a row. One day I do a intermittent fast a little bit longer, one day a little shorter, a little bit more uh, carbohydrate, a little less carbohydrate, but I always keep my fat and protein the same. So when you look on a label, the total carbs minus the fiber equal the net carbs. So we're looking at net carbs. So you'll see it on your label, it'll say 10 grams of uh, carbohydrates, it'll say dietary fiber five, so you subtract that. So that gives you a net of five grams of uh, carbohydrates. So that's what you would count as your day. Here's a better picture, broccoli. So uh, carbohydrate has 10 grams of carbohydrates with a dietary fiber, it's 3.8. So you subtract that at 6.2. You can eat a lot of broccoli to make up that, you know, 100 calories and 100 carbs in a day. And then look at an apple. You hear me do this comparison all the time. So here's your apple. Uh, total carbohydrates are 25 grams less the 4.4 grams of fiber. That's 19 grams of sugar. So that's your 19 carbs for the day. So you can see how I don't care if you have fruit. The only difference between eating vegetables and fruit is the sugar. Same nutrients. If you're eating the colors of the rainbow in your vegetables, you're going to get enough of your vitamin C and all the nutrients you need. I'm not saying you can't have um, sugar or fruit. I'm just saying make sure it goes into your total carbohydrates for the day. Because otherwise, you know, my patients think they're trying to lose weight and they're eating grapes all day. Well, that's just sugar. So you might as well have spoonfuls of sugar because your body is then processing it as sugar. Uh, celery. So this is really a nice bang for your buck there. 0.6 grams of carbohydrates. You can just have your all the celery you want. And you could put really good nut butter on there too. And as kids, we did nut butter with the raisins, the uh, ants on a log. Except the raisins you'd have to count in your carbohydrates on. So protein provides the raw material we need to build our muscles, our bones, our ligaments, our tendons, their, our enzymes, our hormones. Uh, we need some, but we don't have to have too much because if you eat too much protein, it can also trigger insulin as well because pr protein at a high level then gets broken down as sugar. So you have to adjust by the size of the patient or person. Um, so I say three to six ounces per meal is good. It's not an Atkins diet. That's, that's such a misnomer. Atkins, you could have like a pound of bacon and all that. And that's totally not what we're doing here. It's not really healthy. And I will tell you personally, I do mostly um, plant-based protein, about 75% plant-based protein. Some days all plant-based protein. And some days we throw in some chicken, some fish, some eggs. Um, and some red meat. If you can get some good grass-fed, grass-finished beef, that's also good. We had venison. We did Marianne made with the palmini that we talked about last week. Um, I'll send you a link for that. That was the uh, noodles. Oh, they're, they're made out of heart of palm and Marianne made us a lasagna with it. It was amazing. Remember, we are already off the purification. Sorry about that. I start sooner so I can finish early.
Um, so does eating fat make you fat? If there is one thing that you remember from this whole evening is that it's not fat that makes you fat. It's the sugar that makes you fat. If I have to say that a thousand times, I will, but please remember that. So when you, when I eat fat and I eat the majority of my calories in a day are from fat, that doesn't mean I'm eating a stick of butter. Remember we talked a couple of weeks ago that fat has more grams of um, calories per, per gram of more calories per gram than protein and carbohydrates. So it's almost double the calories. So the amount of fat that you eat is adjusted for losing weight or maintaining weight. So I will give you some macros at the end of the, at the end of this um, evening here. So what do you need to burn fat? So because the body considers stored fat is like the last ditch effort for fuel um, and no in case no dietary fats are coming in, we tend to burn up structural proteins, which are our muscles. So if you do a low carb, low fat, high protein diet, you'll still spike your insulin and you'll stress your kidneys and your liver. If you do a low carb, low fat, low protein, you'll burn some fat, but you'll also burn body proteins. So eating, keep, eating fat keeps your body out of stress. And that's super important because I, I feel like the, the people don't understand that when you eat a lot of sugar, you're actually creating a lot of inflammation in your body, which is very stressful to your body. It, it, it messes with your sleep. It messes with your concentration. It messes with just how you handle things and how um, if, if a, an, something happens during the day, you don't handle it as well. So, but if we eat those healthy fats, the brain then will see those signals of no danger so it can let go of its reserves and then the sugar feeds that flight or fight mechanism. So you need the sugar so if a lion rock walks in the room, you need to know, am I going to run away or am I going to fight? Well, you want to burn that sugar really quick and that glycogen, which is already in your muscles. Remember, we talked about 21 tablespoons are stored in your, in your muscles. So fat provides nutrients, fat soluble vitamins like vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and K2. So these are all, especially like K2 from the grass fed, that's what happens is that when they eat the grass, it actually improves the quality of the fat. So if you're, I mean, and trust me, I was a bodybuilder. So I did many years without, you know, eating, we'd rinse everything. We'd rinse our tuna that was packed in water to get all the fat off it. And we did low carb, no fat, high protein. If I knew then what I know now, I'd be a whole different athlete. And, and when I look at, you know, the fat, you can see the foods that you can eat with all these vitamins in there. So, you know, I encourage you to take some vitamins because if you're not eating fish every day, then you need those omega threes, and you're not getting them. You get them from flaxseed, but you know you have to eat a lot of flaxseed to make that happen. So just understand that I want you to eat as much as this of these things as you can. So medium chain fatty acids. That's like your coconut oil, your grass fed butter, your olive oils, your grass fed cheese. The cheese is not grass fed. The cows are grass fed. Pasture raised eggs and grass grass fed beef and pasture raised chickens. Remember, you want the chickens out running around like this, eating grass and seeds and, um, naturally and bugs because that's what they do eat. And those are medium chain triglycerides and they're a monosaturated fat. They bypass the liver and are directly used for energy and they're a low stress fat. So you hear a lot of people talk about um, Bulletproof coffee, which is a coffee with uh, MCT oils, which is usually coconut oil and butter. Um, I've not personally have not done one. It's too much work for me to do in the morning. Um, so, but give it a try. I, you know, and let me know how you like it. And you have to blend it, and that's just it. Just takes too much work for me. I just use organic whipping cream. So ketones, which are produced by the liver for your brain and for fuel, it's a cleaner fuel. It's like using um, gas, natural gas. It's a cleaner fuel than, uh, than gasoline. Three times the energy of sugar, so why wouldn't you want to use it? Very stable to the blood sugar, and it's only produced when the body's starving for car of carbohydrates. And it doesn't have to be super starving, like uh, down that 20 grams, but if you keep it under 100 and between that 50 and 100 range, you would be shocked. The butyric acid also feeds the good gut bacteria and the acetic acid feeds the gut bacteria too. So you've got a lot of benefits. Those are two of the ketones we talked about in the very beginning. So when we look at um, protein here, here's just a hamburger patty here. Um, you can see there are zero carbohydrates, zero dietary fiber and 15 grams of fat and 16 grams of fat, um, so, well, between saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat and monosaturated. So those are all good fats for us. You know, they're more of a, and when, it, when it's grass fed, it's going to be more omega-3 um, happy. 
and that's better for our, our brain as, as uh, just for everything. So when we talk about fat vitamins, vegetables only uh, provide only 5% of those fat soluble vitamins. So animal fats, butter, cod liver oil, fish, eggs, nuts, uh, organ meat, um, K2 is in um, grass-fed animal products. Your butter has your A, D, E, K2, and butyric acid. And those are anti-tumoral, antifungal, and the main source of food for the gut flora. So it's kind of a win-win situation where the sugar becomes a bad in, um, influencer on the gut bacteria. It kills the good bacteria and feeds the bad bacteria. So here's kind of a typical, I'm just gonna move this out of the way for me. Um, here's a typical week. I mean, that looks pretty good. You can do a green smoothie and you can do your protein shake that you're doing now. I do the veggie pro because I don't want the, uh, that's my main source of my plant-based protein. Um, I mean, that looks wonderful. And for me, honestly, we only eat probably two meals a day and do some intermittent fasting, which we'll talk about. But I mean, if you can't be happy with that, that, I mean, I can't help you. All right, so now let's talk about intermittent fasting because the oldest living people are in Okinawa and the things that they do that for every, they have 25 centenarians for every thousand people in Okinawa. So you have 25 people that are over hundred years old out of every thousand people there. And the things that they do are they only eat one meal a day. They, so they basically are intermittent fasting. They exercise every morning. They have green tea. They do something to give back and they eat low carbohydrates. So they don't eat a lot of rice. That's kind of a misnomer. They eat a lot of fish. They eat a lot of um, uh, kelp and a lot of veggies. So intermittent fasting is a way to kind of pattern your eating so that you do get hungry. Because remember, when you get hungry, that's your body's signal to start burning fat. So when you get hungry and you don't eat, you're creating lipase being released and when you're cleaving off those fatty acids for fuel. So you're actually getting your body to burn fat. So just remember that next time you get hungry, you know how you're working out in the yard or doing something, you get hungry and then you keep working and it passes. You're not going to die. You sleep all night without getting up to eat. You won't die, I promise. So instead of counting a bunch of calories, which I don't do, um, you know, I, I find it's just easier to count my carbs and I count my protein and my fat. I really don't count. It just kind of works out. Um, but I'll give you some, some little rules to follow. So the benefits of intermittent fasting are reduced blood pressure, blood lipids, and inflammation. You increase your fat burning, your growth hormones, and your metabolic rate, and you improve appetite, blood sugar, and neurogenesis because food tastes so wonderful when you have real butter on it, I must say. So the variants of inter uh, intermittent fasting are alternate day fasting. So you can do a 36-hour fast and a 12-hour feed. Meal skipping, kind of do it randomly. Uh, eat, stop, eat, a 24-hour fast, one or two times per week, 16-hour um, fast, eight-hour feed. That's mostly what I do. So I do a 16-8, and that doesn't mean I eat for eight hours. That means I eat two meals. And so we usually eat dinner about 6.30 with the exception of tonight. And then I won't eat again till the next day until um, 10.30. So that gives me a good 16-hour break. And then I have my, I break my fast. I may have a protein shake midday, and then I have my, the rest of my meal at night. So I try to eat my bigger meal at lunchtime. So that works super well. And like I said, I really don't get hungry because if you're eating enough fat, you're satiated. So the warrior diet, I do that probably twice a week. It just kind of works out. I'll do a 20-hour fast with a four-hour feed. So you can do an induction phase. You can limit meals to eight hour windows, even just go noon to eight o'clock PM, you know, only eat at that time. Um, you know, pick the time that you do. I'm an early bird, so we just go a little bit earlier. Try not to eat right before you go to bed. If we do have something, it's either blueberries with a little organic whipping cream on it, maybe some nuts. Uh, maintenance plan, you know, want to limit your meals to one four hour window, six to 10 o'clock. And that's if you're late, if you're an earlier person, I would do four to six. Uh, during fasting, you can consume your coffee, your green teas, your fiber, and your branch chain amino acids. Um, like I said, I have coffee. Right now I'm doing tea, but um, I put organic whipping cream in it, and that satiates me. And also I kind of fat fast, so I have that in the morning, but I don't eat anything until my I break my fast. So what to eat during that feeding window. So you want to just stick along this red window over here, low carbohydrate, high fat, and I say medium protein. So 
if you, I'll, I'll send this to you in the email tomorrow because this is how I want you to kind of think about it. Um, I'll, I'll give you your macros. And remember, macros are your proteins, carbohydrates, and your fats. I'll give you what macros to do. We did talk about that before, but I'll just give you a little reminder so you can calculate your own. So you want to do, this will give you enough micronutrients, but I, I would say in your high protein, I would stay more, um, uh, a little bit lower, kind of a medium, uh, but definitely lower on the carbohydrates. So what are your goals now? You're going to maintain your results. You're going to just quit and you know, lose it all that you just worked for. You know, I gave you this weekend off. We didn't have Super Bowl this weekend, but Super Bowl's next weekend. So you can still be smart. I'm not saying you can't have those foods, but if you count them into your macros, you can. Guacamole is always in there. Um, we have some wonderful hummuses. Marianne found one that has, is made with olives. It's, it's delightful. Um, so, you know, you can do all those kind of things when you have a Super Bowl party and not feel like you're being left out. Um, you want to, you know, if you still want to lose some weight, if you want to boost up your immune system, if you have specific health issues, you know, those are things you can talk to me about. And remember, this decision that will impact you for the rest of your life. Everything you put in your mouth is your choice. Remember, choice of nutrition, choice of suicide. So make it a good choice. So we want to incorporate those healthy diseases so we can slow down that those old um, habits that will create chronic disease. So your diet is a bank account. Good food choices are good investments. So we talk about a new normal. So we want to introduce some foods. Um, we want to talk about some supplementation to do, meal plans, food journal, and all that kind of stuff. So let's get that in. So I say this all the time. You need to have a good multi. You want to have a good trace mineral with B12, and you want to have fish oil. Anybody over 50, I recommend cod liver oil because it's high in vitamin A, vitamin D, the liver from the cod, because I've seen a lot of your food logs, and there's no liver on there. And if you're not going to eat it, I'm going to make you take it. And then the omega-3s, which are your DHA and EPA. DHA is for your brain. EPA is to support the brain. So you want to do that. And the reason why I like stand process, I know you know this, but it's because it's whole food. I mean, it's it's like real food. They're just in the concentrations that you couldn't eat, like the green food on, on, on your program. That is so loaded with uh, broccoli, kale, and Brussels sprouts, which are your cruciferous vegetables, which were higher in a, a, a glucophorin, which is what helps to put us through um, liver detox, but it's also an anti-aging or healthy aging uh, component. So it pays to eat your veggies. So you may not crave the foods that you have tolerance for, but you may feel an adrenaline rush after you eat them, um, only to crash and feel drained afterwards. So let's talk a little bit about that because some of you haven't, we haven't talked about this before or it's, the program's new to some of you. So symptoms associated with food allergies and tolerances, you're gonna be adding foods back in that may be causing some of these problems. So it's usually the food that you crave you wanna suspect. And so I would, you know, try adding that food in first, but I'll give you an order to kind of do that. But these are all common symptoms of food intolerances. So allergy and intolerance, here's the difference. Allergies, the body's immune system mistakes a food or something as harmful. It happens fast, usually minutes to hours, sneezing, hives, nausea, migraines, red eyes. Intolerance is a digestive response, system's response to part of a food or an additive it can't process, and that causes some irritation, a longer time frame, up to a few days. For me, I'm not allergic to wheat, but I'm intolerant to it. So if I eat it, I get heart palpitations. It feels like I'm having a heart attack, and that doesn't feel good, so I just don't eat it. I can do a sourdough just because it's, uh, you know, so if somebody that's allergic to wheat, you could do a sourdough because it's a starter, and it uh, operates differently than uh, regular bread. All right. So here's, these are the most, sorry, most common food allergies, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, eggs, milk, wheat, and soy. So you need to be aware of those. And you, if you already have food allergies, you know what they are. And a lot of times eggs will not be, um, and have allergens if they're grass fed, grass finished. And same thing with milk. Um, I do try to stay away from milk other than my organic whipping cream. And I do that uh, once or twice in the morning. And then we, we kind of are careful with cheese and we don't, I personally don't do a lot of wheat anyway. So when you reintroduce foods, uh, that's how you, it's a, this is the perfect time to figure out if you have any intolerances and then you can kick it out of your diet. So 
introduce a new food every 48 hours if you, and track how you feel. Just put it on a piece of paper. That And like I said, it's a food you suspect. It's usually a food you crave. And I don't know why the body does that. It's, that's just a mean trick the body does. So if you have a reaction occur, remove that food and wait 72 hours before you add another food back in. And usually the foods that are highly processed are going to be you know, subject to that. So here's the order you can introduce them Re back, re reintroduce them back into your diet. Start with your grains first <clears throat> and see if you have any problems with any of those. Then dairy, cheese, milk, yogurt, butter, um, nuts and seeds, shellfish, and then eggs. So try your eggs and try grains. And then tr like I said, try your uh, free range eggs. And you know, this is Girl Scout cookies. I could only find a 2012, but you know that Girl Scout cookies are coming up around the corner. And I just want you to be aware of there's allergens in these cookies. So I, don't, I want you to be safe, so be aware, okay? You shouldn't be eating them anyway. Uh, when, I, when I was growing up, well, my mom would give us three cookies. It's the part of the Trinity thing, but um, that's what we learned. So we learned moderation. So one in 25 Americans have a food allergy. Fewer than one in 25 Americans have a food allergy. And this is kind of the, the breakdown, <clears throat> women more than men. And hives is probably the one, the biggest thing. Uh, anaphylaxis is the next, and they kind of, you know, dwindle down. So it's pretty quick to, you're pretty quick to find out what foods you're allergic to. And most people have intolerances. So your future meal plan should still be diet that's complex and rich, rich in, you know, nutrients and fiber dense foods. Um, you have your uh, pamphlet, which has the, the ideas of that. Keep your mind of your BMR and your exercise. And if you, if you want, you know, set up time with me and call Tina, call Marianne, set up a time to do a functional medicine appointment where we'll break it all down and, and gear it toward exactly what you need. So your shopping list, I mean, I would keep it generally the same. You can start adding some foods back in. And if you're going to do a keto style diet, then there are some foods you won't add back in. But still, my bottom line rule is twice as many veggies as fruit. And your best is fresh um, shop fresh, get fresh and organic. And remember, shop that outer ring of the grocery store when you're in there. Don't get in the, into the middle part. That's the bad part. And try a co-op. So when we talk about, I, I wanted to call, talk about a couple of different things about food additives, because I didn't really talk about that before, but um, you know, what's in your hot dog? And then one of the, I, I have stories about hot dogs I don't want to go into, but um, children eating 12 plus hot dogs a month have nine times the more the normal risk of developing leukemia. One hot dog contains over 50 milligrams of cholesterol, hormones, antibiotics, pesticides, chemicals, and dyes. Uh, TMAO, which is a chemical that uh, increases the risk of heart disease, nasty parts and cruelty, intestines, now, I've, I mean, I've seen this in person, spleen, fat, lips, hair, and feces all go into making a, a tube steak, which is what we call them. Uh, nitrates cause cancer, compounds increase by 67%, your risk, uh, over 600 milligrams of sodium, per dog. Um, and then more health risks are one 150 milligram serving of processed meat a day. One hot dog gives a person 43% higher risk of heart disease, 19% risk of type two diabetes and 18% risk of colorectal cancer. That's huge. So don't eat that stuff. There's so many good things you can eat. And, and then I have to talk about glyphosate and which is Roundup. We have it in our foods. Uh, they actually have, you know, they tell wheat farmers, spray your wheat, kill it with Roundup. That way it doesn't mold. Well, we're the ones eating that. And look at, look at over here on these, uh, the, these foodstuffs that are processed. They measured the glyphosate in Oreos. They measured it in all the chips. So, I mean, look at the, look at Simply, Stacy Simply Naked Pita Chips, 812.53 parts per billion. That's a lot. So you're getting it and we don't even, you know, you don't even know you're getting it because you, you think you're trying to do the good right thing, but you can see some of these bars and everything. So it's, it's a little scary. So GMO, uh, genetically modified soy protein fillers, uh, high fructose uh, corn syrup is done with uh, genetically modified corn, Roundup Ready corn is what we call it. Um, gen genetically modified canola oil and potatoes are desiccated with herbicides. They actually grow tomatoes to absorb all the, the poisons in the, in the ground. So uh, it's kind of a trash potato. So we don't want to eat that anyway. Um, and th this is a paper that was talking about glyphosate. It's um, 
is a destructor of human health and biodiversity. The manufacturers claim glyphosate is safe. However, independent research provides evidence that glyphosate is destroying human and animal health as a result of disruption of gut bacteria. Two key problems caused by this are the diets are nutritional deficiencies, especially minerals and essential amino acids and system toxicity. We don't need that, but you know, you're exposed to it and don't even know it. And if your neighbors are using it, what can you do? So this was a, 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 a experiment a kid did and I just, I saw it and I just had to put it on here. So you can see the GMO corn and the organic corn was put out. Look what the, even the squirrels know what to eat and we can't even make that decision for ourselves. So these are some of the health problems associated with glyphosate, which are digestive issues, obesity, autism, Alzheimer's disease, depression, Parkinson's disease, liver disease and, and cancer. So you are what you eat and what they ate. And you can see this pretty picture here. Well, guess what? Farmers feed their cows Skittles. Some farmers add candy, chocolate, cereal, or molasses to their conventional feed as a cheap substitute for corn because sugar reportedly helps cows with digestion, increases milk production, and fattens up beef cattle. Mars Incorporated sells their unused Skittles to companies that melt them down and add them to livestock feed, which farmers then buy to save money when the cost of corn is too high. It's a little scary out there. So that's why we try to go local. We try to get um, um, beef or chicken that's um, you know grass-fed, grass-finished, uh, free range, because we know we're going to get a better quality product. And still, I mean, I, I we don't eat tons of protein either. We may have a steak a couple times a month, um, making sure it's grass fed, grass finished. And, you know, we don't, we don't usually have it every day either. So keep that in mind. Um, let's see here. So we want to remember to shop or, uh, organic and local. And so yesterday we got turned on to a new place in Eustis. I'm sorry all my winter park folks, but you can come out on the weekend. So I will send you a, the, the proper link for this. This is not the correct link, but it's called Noble Roots Farm. Look at these veggies. So we got some carrots, we got some kale, we got a daikon, which is down in the corner there. Uh, we didn't get peppers, we're not the big fan. We got the purple cauliflower and they had grass fed beef. So our whole, and we had just a huge bag with all the vegetables cost us $10. And we had this huge um, ribeye. It was probably that thick, that big, and that was $30, but it, we would probably got three meals off that. And we just put that in the freezer. So they have a um, crop sharing program. So I will send that link to you in the morning. So don't worry about this link here. So the other thing I want you to think about too is uh, looking at your just a healthy living. So uh, EWG, which is the environmental working group.org has some great apps out there. You can download it. Um, it's got a healthy living app and it rates um, 120,000 foods and personal care products. So when you're in the store, you can check it right there uh, to put the product name or even scan it. So that's kind of cool. And it gives you a, a guide to healthy cleaning, uh, safety ratings for more than 2,500 products. Uh, shows you what your favorite foods rate on the food scores. So you want to take a trip down some real reality lane. Here's your thing. It also has a skin deep um, for cosmetics in their database, over 60,000 products and always adding to that. And that's all done on an app. So I know everybody has a phone, so you can use that phone to do that. So uh, EWD.org, you can go to their Dirty Dozen. So this is the dozen, uh, Dirty Dozen for this year. Strawberry, spinach, kale. Uh, nectarines, apples, grapes, peaches, cherries, pears, tomatoes, celery, and potatoes. Those are the ones you want to make sure you buy organic. And these are what we call the clean 15. Avocados, sweet corn, pineapples, frozen peas, onions, papayas, eggplant, asparagus, kiwis, cabbage, cauliflower, cantaloupes, broccoli, mushrooms, and honeydew melons. And you can go on there and get their list off there. At, um, EW, or you can just Google clean 15 and they'll that should pop up in your Google search. So for your daily diet, I want you to continue to eat whole foods. Um, you want to limit those high calories, drop those carbs down, your refined foods and your oils and stay away from those trans fat oils. You want nutrient rich and fiber dense foods, whole unprocessed foods to protect your body, veggies, fruits, oils, animal and plant-based protein. And that's why I do the Veggie Pro Shake because it has the yellow pea, pumpkin seed, and sesame seed proteins in it, 
but it's low carb and it's sweetened with monk fruit, which monk fruit does not raise your glycemic index. So it's my choice to do for a, my plant-based protein because it's easy. I can put it in a shake and I just do heavy scoops to give me, you know, 20, 30 grams of protein in a shake. So your steps to eating well and being green. You want to eat local. So this is your challenge. Eat foods within 10 mile radius from your home. Find an organic co-op to join. Uh, eat at an organic or raw food restaurant at least once per month. Grow at least one vegetable. Try tomatoes. Plant a butterfly garden. Milkweed is the easiest thing to plant. Compost and recycle. Those are things that we've done over the years to you know, help our environment. Uh, we recycle a ton. We compost everything. When, you, when you're eating fresh fruits and vegetables, there's parts you're not going to eat. We go, it goes in the compost that has never filled up. We've had, I've had it probably for 12 years now, and it's still not full. It keeps just going down. And there's an azalea bush behind it. And the flowers bloom pretty much year round. It's a pretty happy plant. So I want you to be healthy for a lifetime. So just be aware there's you know roadblocks all the way. Don't try to lose too much, uh, too fast. Don't underestimate the number of calories or nutrients in your foods. Watch your carbohydrates. Prepare for your social gatherings. If you're going to go someplace, take something you can eat. We always uh, ours is easy as guacamole and some carrot chips. And I'll take other kind of crackers for some or dip or something. I mean uh, other chips for somebody else to eat, but I'll eat the crackers or celery, whatever. Um, use portion control, if, you know, use new foods that you've never tried before so you don't get bored. Uh, keep your processed and ref refined foods out of the house. Don't buy them. If you can't eat them if they're not in the house. Uh, limit your alcohol and caffeine. You know, you can have one glass of wine a day, not an eight ounce pour, about five ounces. Guys can have about seven, but you could do it. I mean, that's good for you. I was reading an article and it said one glass of wine, the, the health benefits are amazing. The second glass of wine negates everything. So have a good glass of wine, sip it, enjoy it, savor it, because that second glass is going to take it away and then some. So here's a little picture over here that you can see that has your sizes. So like if you're out and about at a restaurant, you want to know what a cup is, a baseball, a tennis ball is three cups, three quarters of a cup, half a cup is a computer mouse, uh, one quarter cup is the size of an egg, three ounces of a deck of cards, uh, two tablespoons is the size of a ping pong ball. That way you can kind of estimate what you're getting in there, putting in the chute there. So I know this is going to happen because it, it just does. Not only did I fall off the wagon, the diet wagon, I dragged into the woods, set it on fire and used the insurance money to buy cupcakes. You can laugh. I know it's some of you, this is what, what happens. I understand that, but it, it, life happens. We have the, we're human. We have the, you know, tendencies that, you know, take us right back to the bad foods that made us feel bad in the first place, which it's so hard to understand that, why we're so addicted to those foods that are not good for us, but we're addicted to the sugar, we're addicted to the, the chemicals, the MSG and stuff they put in processed foods, so it makes it happen. So we're doing, here's our class schedule for the year, um, April, July, October, we're going to do Zoom, and I changed my 10-day programs to three classes because I, I felt like I had too much information to give you, and I try to change up the information. When I hear new stuff, I put that together. Um, but I will do three classes from now on for the 10 day programs because I feel that gives me more time to give you the information because I, I, I feel like there's so much information out there. And to me, my job is to kind of go through it and tell you what's really accurate and what's not. I'm not perfect. And when I see something that, that is incorrect, I will change it and, and, and re, you know, repurpose it so that it's useful for you. For me, I mean, I've made changes my whole um, career because as I learn things, I change things. I, I threw out Splenda because I thought Splenda was better than I found out it wasn't, so I got rid of it. You know, I haven't done a soda and I don't know how long. I will not do a hot dog. I haven't eaten a McDonald's hamburger. I have not. McDonald's hamburger or a Burger King hamburger uh, or Chick-fil-A. Um, so... I, I just don't do that. And, and, and you, you'll find that as you've cleaned your diet, your palate is so much cleaner and foods taste better to you. So I will send a copy of this, of the class schedule with you for um, on the email tomorrow and a couple links that I want you to look at. So I want you to encourage some healthy habits. So I want you to incorporate exercise into your daily routine. I want you to walk at least 30 to 40 minutes a day, five days a week is best. You know, you need to have at least three and a half hours, uh, sorry, two and a half hours of exercise per day. That's 30 minutes a day, minimum. 
So I would do a little bit of cardio and a little bit of strength. You got to do both. Sweating is good. We, we say sweating is, is fat crying, um, it, but it helps to rid your body of toxins and, you know, sweating a couple of times, whether you do exercise or sauna, especially if you have an infrared sauna, hint, hint, clue, clue for somebody on this, watching this today, um, get enough sleep, try to keep your sleep schedule consistent, practice stress management um, so you can be your best mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Uh, 10,000 steps a day is a good guideline. Uh, remember, you can continue this protocol for the rest of your life. That's what we do. So that really, for me, for our household, the, the one thing we don't do during the purification, the only thing we really cut out are cheese and wine. Simple as that. So that's how um, you know, good our diet is over the years. Doesn't mean we don't have foods every, off, every, every once in a while. But, you know, don't be watch these things that come into your life here. Like, you know, we think that naked juice sounds so healthy, but it's really made by Pepsi. Uh, Adwala is also owned by Coca-Cola. Bull House Farms is owned by Campbell's. We already know what their products have done. So they try to give them healthy labels to entice those of us that are trying to make these healthy changes. But a Nutribullet is owned by you. You can make anything you want. So you've always heard me complain about, not complain, but I talk about my Nutribullet that I've had for over 10 years and I can't kill the thing. It's a 600 watt and I encourage you to buy the 900 watt. I was gifted a Nutribullet Pro Plus. So I'm so excited. So I now I have my new fast extraction blade Nutribullet. So I have a good use one for, no, I'm just kidding. I'm keeping that one. So our goal is to help you create a lifetime of health and vitality. So I just want to thank everybody for being here. This is my little cat, Tipper. She's gotten so much older, but she really does have a little heart on her side and one on her nose, too. So we're here for you. Dr. Cooper's knowledgeable. Marianne and, and Tina can help you. If you have questions, please email us or call, and we'll be glad to answer your questions. So till next year or till April, we'll see you soon.